Okay, good morning, everybody. Do you hear me? Okay, good, good. Right, I want to firstly apologise for the technical hitch we, we had just there. We just had to send out a new link. Uh, and obviously the guys that are, that are with us at the moment have, have received that link and have joined joined this event. So welcome, first of all. Um, we'll just um, give a few seconds for, for a couple more people to join. I can see that a few people are joining as we speak. So if you don't mind bearing with us. OK, OK, the numbers are the numbers are up there. The numbers are moving quickly. So OK, let's let's make a start. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, apologies again for the uh, the short delay there. Um, we had a bit of a technical a technical problem. So thanks for taking the time to join us um, today. My name's Andy Boot. Um, I'm joined with my colleague Nicola Terrien. We're going to be talking about MPSH and cavitation in pump systems. So. Um, I'm the sales manager from the oil and gas business unit for our surface pump products. Nicholas um, is uh, leading our tender and sales activity internally. So um, I've been with PCM for about 15 years. Nicholas has been with PCM for, for around uh, 12 years and we've both had various different different uh, roles within the group, but uh, we've had a lot of experience with with progressing cavity pump technology. Um, Nicholas is a graduate mechanical engineer from the Paris Technical Network uh, and uh, he's had a role in the service centre as a, as, a, as a technician. He's been involved in, in project management and uh, he's currently, as I say, he's played a leading role in our, in our in, internal sales and tender activity. Um, I'm talking to you from the UK. Nicholas is, is in France, in Champassay, where PCM has its headquarters and main factory manufacturing facility. Um, it's a beautiful part of the, of the country there in, in, the, in the Loire Valley, in the, in the winemaking region. Um, we've also, we're also assisted by Benjamin Robert. Benjamin is uh, in the background here helping us with the presentation today. Uh, so he's in control of everything you see. Um, just a few words on how this this works today. Um, if everybody please keeps their microphones off, uh, there's there's a lot of people here and it's not practical for everybody to to speak. So what we'll do there's a there's a Q and A facility. So in the top right hand corner of your screen, you should see a little a little question mark. If you click on there, um, that will enable you to to type your questions as we as Nicholas and I will will talk through today's material. Uh, you fire away with your questions and we'll have a session at the end where we will uh, will endeavour to address the questions that you pose to us during the during the, uh, the presentation. Um, so. Yeah, try and keep your those questions. If you can keep them on topic, we'd appreciate it. If you've got any questions that, that still relate to, to our to, to progress and cavity pumps or pumps in general or applications, but less perhaps are not related to MPSH and cavitation. We're happy to have a discussion on those uh, uh, another time. So we'll create a new event or we'll, we'll engage with you directly uh, outside of this webinar. So um, yeah, try and just if you can keep any questions that you have on topic, that will be much appreciated. Um, OK, so again, just thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we appreciate it. Sorry again for the for the technical issue and the, and the delay that we've just uh, encountered, but uh, we'll try and get ourselves back on track. Um, OK, so. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm very pleased to present, uh, to present it. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it and uh, see you later. Thanks, Nic Nicholas. That was uh, that was Nicholas for everybody. So you can put a face to the name to the guy that's about to tell you everything about MPSH. Um, OK, can we have a look at the uh, the agenda, please, Benjamin? OK, everybody, so uh, we'll start with a very brief introduction. Uh, we're going to look at NPSH. Nicholas is going to talk about NPSH and tell us why it's important in a pump system. Um, then we'll have a bit of a discussion about cavitation uh, and, and the the negative effects that that cavitation can can have on a on a pump and within a within a pump system um, 
we will move on to, sorry, I don't have the same screen as you guys. Um, we'll look at how measures that can be taken within a system and, and within a pump to avoid cavitation from occurring. And we will uh, look at some solutions on, on ways to improve MPSH conditions in, MP, in challenging MPSH applications. And then we'll move on to, to the questions at the end. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, please, Benjamin. OK, so MPSH, it's it's a real um, issue. It's something that's commonly misunderstood in, in the pump world. It's a re and cavitation is, is a real world problem. It's, it's, an, it's something that PCM sees uh, quite frequently. So we get a lot of customers coming to us when they face MPSH problems. If they've got their in making a new installation, MPSH is particularly low, uh, the MPSH available or they have an existing pump in operation that's suffering from cavitation and it, it's usually a question that um, the system the, 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 the system doesn't have sufficient MPSH available in it and there's da damage to the pump. So uh, PCM usually we get, we get called along to provide something to adapt the system and uh, provide something that works. It can be pretty costly to get it wrong in the first instance, so so it's always best to have the right pump installed from the beginning. Um, of course, changes dur during uh, once the equipment is operational are expensive and uh, and time consuming and disruptive to, to operation. So so nobody wants that. Um, as a, as as pump manufacturers, as pump specifiers, and pump users, we've got a, a responsibility to to understand MPSH, understand cavitation, uh, and do our best to to uh, ensure that these undesirable effects don't occur in our live systems. Um, as I say, if you've got some of exper experiences of your own, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to to have a conversation, get your feedback. Some of you guys are, are end users, some of you are using the equipment and you've got your own experiences. So um, we'd love to have an exchange with you uh, and share those experiences together. Uh, and we'll, of course, ex share our experiences with you. Um, so but we'll, we'll, um, with, that, with that said, let's, uh, let's move on to an introduction. I'm going to hand you over to Nicholas. He's going to give you an introduction to NPSH and tell you exactly what it is. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear us uh, properly. Uh, if it's not the case, do not hesitate to ask us to reformulate at the end uh, of the presentation um, through the question uh, question um, tab. Um, so here, yeah, um, first of all, let's have a definition of the NPSH. Um, it stands for Net Positive Suction Head. Here, we will focus um, on the NPSH available. Um, because we have two levels of analysis. First of all, the install installation side, um, with the upstream line uh, up to the pump. And we have also the equipment point of view, which is here, the pump. Um, let's focus here on the NPSH available. Um, roughly, um, it represents, um, uh, it's a function of the system surrounding the pump the properties of the fluid and the ambient conditions. It is given in meter or feet um, of liquid column. Um, roughly, it, it aims to represent the actual amount of energy that is available at the pump intake. Uh, this is installation um, input. Um, let, let's have a, a macro view of a typical, uh, typical installation here. Um, on the right side, you have a typical, uh, I would say PNID, but that's a draft. Uh, we have a tank upstream with some here, some water. Um, we have a line, a drain line below the tank. And after we have the pump. We focus on this first, uh, first uh, side, the tank, the line up to the pump. Um, if we want to represent the NPSH available with this macro view, it will correspond to the absolute pressure acting on the liquid surface on the tank. Maybe an atmospheric tank, an open drain tank, for example, um, it will be directly the atmospheric pressure. Um, 
to that absolute pressure, we will remove the friction losses from the tank up to the pump. And we will also add the static head, which is the elevation between the initial reference of the absolute pressure up to the pump intake elevation. It's important to, to talk about elevation because we are talking about meter or feet of liquid column, which will talk about a certain reference. And at the end, we have a certain amount of pressure and we remove the vapor pressure of the pump liquid at the actual pumping temperature. That will give us the NPSH available. Now, um, let's focus on the other point of view, uh, which is NPSH required. Here, we focus on the pump. We have seen previously what is available, what is given available by the installation at the pump intake. Now, let's compare it to the NPSH required. But what is the NPSH required? It's a function of the pump and advised by the pump manufacturer. It is also given in meter or feet, uh, so we can compare it with the NPSH available. On this side, it represents the amount of energy needed by the pump to overcome the pump's internal resistance so that it works. And basically, what we should do is we should compare the NPSH available to the required. The, NPS, the pumps will require a certain amount of NPSH available by the installation. So, we, we should uh, always have an NPSH available, which is greater than the NPSH required to, ev to avoid the phenomenon of cavitation that will be described later on. Um, at least, we should keep 0.5 meter margin between the NPSH required and NPSH available. This is a good practice. Um, this is a good practice. Um, this is not something which is uh, given by the API. This is a, a guideline uh, that we widely um, see in the end user specification. Sometimes it's another uh, requirement for margin. It's uh, one meter, for example, more conservative. Once again, this is just a good practice. In some cases, uh, for example, uh, closed grain or where we are um, dealing with condensate, um, you have a very, a very low margin um, between the available and the required. So such, um, such uh, safety margin may be challenged. And on so some Nicola, case, Nicola, can I just yeah. ask, is there any particular requirement of, of the API standard to have an NPSH margin? No, uh, the, no, the the API standards that that are used for many of the pump here, or centrifugal pumps or uh, positive displacement pumps, um, does not call for a certain margin. Uh, we should ensure that there is a positive margin, but most of the time the margin, the safety margin that we should consider are given by the end user specification or for project specification. Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, talking about this margin, um, when, when we are dealing with such a, a small margin, uh, when it is challenging, we may, uh, we may perform an advanced test, an advanced measurement test to, to characterize uh, the pump uh, properties, the pump NPSH required to be sure that it will be uh, maintained. Um, and for that, we have a pragmatic, uh, widely accepted definition of the pump NPSH air, that is uh, a point at which its performances falls below its non cavitating performances. What does that mean? It means that, for example, for such fuel pumps, uh, the API 610 uh, will give a certain limit uh, of 3% of loss of head at that point, and for the PCPs, positive displacement pumps, um, it will be 3% of loss of flow rate uh, when the NPSH air uh, is equal to the NPSH available. Um, this is a reference. We will have a, a curve later on uh, so we can figure it out. Uh, it will be uh, maybe better for your understanding. Now I will present you the cavitation. Okay, thanks Nicolas. Um, Right, so let's let's look at cavitation, um, this this so-called phenomenon. Um, what is it exactly? As Nicholas has just explained. Once uh, the NPSH in the system falls below 
MPSH available falls below the MPSH required, uh, we're, we're leading ourselves onto this uh, this cavitation effect. So cavitation is the formation of bubbles and then their subsequent collapse. And what ha once your suction pressure at any region on 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 say suction pressure, but the pressure in any any region of the pump or the system falls below the vapor pressure of that particular fluid, whatever it is that you're pumping, um, your fluid is essentially going to boil. Um, knowing that fluids can boil at uh, different temperatures, uh, different pressures, different temperatures according to the pressure. So it's, it's, a, it's an equation that involves temperature pressure uh, and vapor pressure. So um, once those bubbles form and that, that liquid essentially boils um, in a low pressure region, those bubbles then will move to a th throughout the pump and they'll move to a, to a higher pressure region. And once they reach a pressure uh, above the, the vapor pressure of the fluid, then those bubbles will then then collapse, um, and they do so in quite a violent or, 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 or a violent manner. So they do it quickly, um, and it's this collapsing bubble that creates uh, a, a microjet. It's a very high intensity uh, pressure shock, which um, is what actually causes the the damage to the pump. We'll see on the, on the next slides in a few moments but uh, cavitation therefore they so it's in summary is the it's a creation of these bubbles and they're very quick collapse and uh, it's, it's the collapsing of, of the bubbles which which causes the damage and sometimes it's it's a common misunderstanding that it's the bubbles themselves that, that are causing the damage that's that's not the case they can have detrimental effects as, as we'll discuss in a moment or two but uh, the the bubbles themselves aren't actually the damaging uh, factor. Okay, so once you have cavitation um, in a pump, these bubbles can ca cause uh, a loss of performance in, in a positive displacement pump particularly. What happens is these bubbles are occupying volume which should otherwise be occupied by liquid, so uh, you're moving less liquid. As, as a result, and therefore you see a reduced uh, performance in, in your pump. Um, so in a positive displacement pump, it tends to be a loss of a loss of flow. In a in a um, centrifugal pump, it tends to be a loss of pressure creation. So lo loss of pressure and um, also flow in a centrifugal pump. So that then can possibly lead to an increase in power consumption as the operator tries to compensate for any any loss in performance, equipment gets ramped up, speeds get ramped up, um, consuming consuming more power. Um, some of the other effects, um, loud noises are probably the first sign of cavitation in a pump and then, and then vibration. So the noise of cavitation, the sound of cavitation is a kind of gravelly, gravelly noise. Um, and this, it, whilst itself is not uh, damaging the noise, the noise is not damaging. Um, it it does lead on to it's a it's a first sign. It's a first sign. Um, the vibration um, can lead to uh, premature failure of of seals uh, and bearings. So it starts to become costly, uh, and bearing replacement, seal replacement, uh, it's it's ex it can get a, get into an expensive affair, and um, it's going to cause you. Uh, downtime. So, <clears throat> and ultimately, if it, if it goes on for, for long periods of time, it can damage critical parts, so rotating parts and even, even the housing of a pump. So these, these jets uh, are quite damaging to, to metallic parts. They can remove over time gradually. They are, they are eroding essentially parts of the material. So they cause the, the pump to become, to become weak. Uh, and as you can see on, on the images here, on the, at the bottom, we've got a, a centrifugal pump impeller which has been affected by cavitation, um, and then it's become weakened and it's and it's actually, actually broken. It's it's snapped off. On the right, you can see um, probably less severe uh, damage, but that area of the pump is particularly susceptible to cavitation, and you can see the erosion that's taken place on the impeller. The image that you can see on the top right there, that's a progressing cavity pump, um, and that shows 
it's cavitation damage. If you look at the center of the image, you can see what looks like small craters. Uh, and this is where the um, small parts of the material have been removed um, as a result of, of cavitation. So I'm going to put back, give you back to Nicholas for a few moments and he's going to talk uh, about what steps can be taken to, to minimise or avoid cavitation in a pump. Thank you, Oli. Uh, I think now we better understand uh, why we want to avoid such a bad feeling and of cavitation. Let's see how we can, uh, how we can reach this objective. Um, as we, we have seen previously, um, there is a, a safety margin between the PSH air and PSH available. As a good practice, we should firstly try to maintain this safety margin. We have different levels. We have the installation side and we have the equipment side. First of all, for the installation uh, level, what we can do is to increase, to, is to maximize the PSH available in order to increase the margin at the end. Um, how, to, how to maximize the PSH available? First of all, one main component of the NPSH uh, available being the absolute pressure acting on the pump. Um, in case you are in a closed vessel, for example, uh, meaning so that absolute pressure, maybe the process condition can be uh, modified, can be updated in order to, to have more pressure upstream. And as a result, you will have more pressure at the pump intake. Uh, more pressure, uh, meaning more margin uh, versus the vapor pressure of the liquid. Um, we can also play on the static head in the system, meaning we have a certain tank with a certain absolute pressure and the pump will be located below the tank. Uh, most of the time it's tricky to play on this uh, elevation because we have restrictive uh, dimensions. Um, but when we can do that, when we can increase the height of the of the drum, for example, it will also increase the static head and it will also give you more oxygen in the in this uh, purpose. A third lever is uh, the friction losses that uh, that will be between the tank and the pump intake. Uh, let's imagine you have uh, numbers of, uh, of valve, numbers of elbows. For sure, it will alter the the NPSH uh, available since you will uh, you will alter you will reduce. Uh, the, the, the flow rate will increase uh, the pressure drops in the upstream line. This is for the installation. Uh, basically, we have other levers uh, to play on the installation side, but this is basically some uh, major ones. Um, on the other side, we can, uh, we can focus on the NPSH air of the pump in order to minimize it. Um, how can we do that? First of all, one of the most important is to select the most appropriate pump technology. We will see later on in this presentation that the pump technology does not offer the same typical NPSH required, the same range of NPSH required. Um, then, having set this pump technology, um, we can optimize the pump internal resistance. So it will mean for a certain pump, um, a smoother diameter, a smoother design, uh, reducing the internal resistance, re reducing the internal drop, um, so it will require less uh, NPSH. Another, uh, another uh, criteria that we can play on is the, the pump speed. Um, since the NPSH requirement of the pump is also linked to the high velocity uh, local regions uh, on the pump, reducing the pump speed will also reduce um, such a local uh, high velocity. Um, and you will also reduce the PSH required on the pump. The, that's the basic requirement for, for the PSH uh, air on the pump. Um, now we can see another uh, solution to lower the PSH on the application. But first of all, I, I would like to, to come back on the, the curve on the right, which is a typical curve um, for, for PSH testing a pump. Uh, here it's, uh, it's for a PCP. Uh, for sure, we are PCP maker, so uh, we have uh, this curve at our disposal. Um, basically, on the bottom axis, uh, you have uh, the NPSH of the installation. And what we want to do in such a test is to make the NPSH available, meeting 
uh, the PSH required on the plan. And if you, let's say we start on the right and we come back on the left to decrease in PSH available in the installation. And at a certain point, the flow rate, which is on the vertical axis, um, will fall down. And at a, cer well, a certain criteria given by the API, um, when we observe a 3% drop of flow rate, this is the reference for the NPSH required. At this point, the NPSH available equals the NPSH required when we observe 3% of, of drop of flow rate. Um, we can see that after this 3%, it will fall, fall down drastically. The, here we will enter directly the bad phenomenon that Andy has just described previously. Uh, it's important to stop this um, measurement there and to observe it easily. Um, no. Uh, so Nicola, it looks, it looks yeah. like once you start, once the pump starts to cavitate there, at, at, let's say well, at three percent drop, it seems to have a quite a drastic effect, very a, a rapid decline. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, for and for your information, uh, when we perform such a test, we can easily, uh, easily uh, hear it. Uh, we have very really quickly uh, and in direct, direct uh, relation to the flow rate, we can directly um, hear a, a bad noise, like a hammer or quick hammer, something like that, a poo, 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 poo. And we, we know that uh, we are reaching the NPSH air. And the curve, the flow rate measurement, will confirm this. Yes, so it, it's directly uh, entering uh, this uh, bad uh, situation. Yeah. Um, now, let's focus on another curve, which is a typical NPSH uh, air curve of a pump. Uh, the objective here is to talk about how we can have a smart approach on the pump control in order to reduce the NPSH uh, air and to make it uh, matching the process expectation. On such a curve, we have on the bottom we have the pump speed, and on the vertical axis, you have the NPSH air. So that's a kind of performance curve. Um, we can see that the NPSH air is directly linked to the uh, pump uh, speed and with a direct, uh, direct coefficient. Um, let's imagine you, have a, you are hunting a tank, for example, a close drain. Uh, it's a typical, uh, typical concern for the close drain, I would say, mid the NPSH. Um, if you, if, if you are pumping um, at a certain flow rate, um, meaning the pump is operating at a certain speed, and when the, when the drum is almost empty, this is the worst case because we have uh, the worst elevation. We have a very low elevation, so a very low static level. Um, in that case, um, in that case, the NPSH would be uh, at the lowest. What we, what we may do is to adjust the pump speed versus, uh, versus the elevation. Lower, the lower is the elevation in the drum, the lower will be the speed. So we will uh, smoothly uh, empty the tank at the end in order to do not, to do not um, present a high NPSH air of the pump when the NPSH available is low as well. So let's say we have a, a continuous margin on the NPSH air that will follow uh, the tank, uh, the tank uh, emptying, tank drawing. Um, also, another point that we, can, that we may, uh, that we may uh, present here, it's uh, the second point. It's uh, the, to design the pump, to specify the pump for the worst conditions. Most of the time, uh, when we need to, to handle different uh, operating cases, uh, because we, that's, that's the process. Uh, we have, uh, for example, some EV hydrocarbons, some light hydrocarbons. Um, everything should be considered in the pump design. It's important to focus on the worst case to do not have over security, over safety. I would say, um, let's imagine the case for, for EV hydrocarbons um, will lead you to a certain flow rate, let's say 20 cubic meters per hour. Let's imagine the case for the light hydrocarbons will lead you to 10 cubic meters per hour, which is half the, of the previous one. We know that the worst case will be with the light hydrocarbons because it will be the more volatile product offering the, uh, the highest uh, vapor pressure. So we will enter 
uh, in, uh, in the bad situation earlier with the light hydrocarbons. But if we want to, to have a smart design, we will consider the worst MPSH only with the, uh, small, the smallest uh, flow rate. No need to consider the MPSH available of the case of light hydrocarbons with the flow rate of the heavy hydrocarbons. That, that lead you to an oversize of the pump, an oversize of the equipment, and so on. So this is another smart approach that we should all consider in order to have an economic design and um, efficient design. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, okay, let's take a, 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 a brief look at some of the um, characteristics of a pump that exhibits that has a has a low, SMP, a low NPSH requirement. So, the, the main two characteristics of, of, of these pumps are low, low speed and low internal resistance. The two the two main factors that that influence the NPSH required by a particular pump type. So. If we take a quick look at a few of the, the technologies that we see in the market and that we, we know you guys are using, um, and we make it just a, a, a brief comparison. So um, starting on the left-hand side here, you'll see a centrifugal pump. And we know that because a centrifugal pump is uh, a high-speed device and through the nature of its operation, uh, you'll find that there are um, low pressure regions, particularly on the uh, underside of the of the impeller and to one side of the on the on the um, leading edge of the the impeller vane. Um, so these low pressure regions in this in this high speed pump device become uh, perfect the perfect opportunity for the for the uh, the bubbles to form as the as the pressure has fallen below below the vapor pressure of the fluid and then as the as the fluid Pump makes its way towards the uh, the pump outlet, and the the casing it becomes subject to, to higher pressure again, uh, and then that's where we see the bubbles collapsing and the the effect of cavitation, particularly on the end of the the, the pump impeller, um, and you've seen from from the images that that we showed earlier, particularly how how all that occurs. Um, the next pump we're showing here is a is a reciprocating pump. Um, of course, oh, by the way, I'm just not. Uh, we we have to acknowledge that not um, every pump is suitable for every application. There's no there's no one perfect pump solution. We're just talking here about um, MPSH and why each particular pump technology exhibits the characteristics that it that it does. Um, so the second pump there. Is is a reciprocating reciprocating pump. This has a a slightly lower uh, NPSH requirement. The the main restriction here is is the valve. So this type of pump with a, a piston moving back and forth relies on valves at the intake and at the discharge, and it's these valves which generate a pressure drop, particularly uh, worsened by the the pulsating effect and the acceleration and deceleration of fluid across those valves. So um, this pump has quite a high level of in, well, I'd say a high level of internal resistance uh, leading to a, a high NPSH requirement. Thirdly, you've got there a, a, a twin screw pump, um, which um, is relatively um, sensitive on, on, the, on the fluid. It's, it doesn't cause too much shearing. Um, the internal resistance of the pump is therefore Pretty, pretty low. It's a high speed pump still. It's, it's operating a few thousand RPM usually. And um, the the MPSH of the consequence is, is, is good. The performance um, is, is relatively low. Um, third, fourth one here, you've got the, the progressing cavity. Um, this is generally a, a much lower speed device. It's operating at typically three, 400 RPM. And the path that the fluid has to take is relatively stress three through this device. It's, it's, it's in fact, it's almost like a, a straight pipe. There are no valves, of course, in, in, in this type of pump. So there's no, there's no pressure drop across the valves. The pump um, is very respectful of the, the fluid by catching a, a portion of the fluid and gently moving it towards the discharge. And as I say, the path 
that it's taking is pretty stress free. So it's it's the lowest uh, it has the lowest internal resistance. So that's just a brief explanation as to why these different pump types exhibit the MPSH characteristics that they do. Benjamin, if we could move on to the next slide, please. We've got just a, a, an example, a brief comparison with a particular application in mind, whereby we compare uh, the MPSH uh, demand that each, each pump has. So we've got the four pump types, uh, the respective API standard. This particular application, it's, it's a hydrocarbon condensate. It's got a high uh, vapor pressure, uh, which makes it particularly susceptible to um, uh, cavitation because it's quite easy to 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 um, to create a pressure less than the vapor pressure of a light hydrocarbon condensate within the pump. So you can see there nothing's particularly outstanding about the the, the operating temperature. We've got a high vapor pressure as we as we mentioned with this particular fluid, um, and an MPSH available in this in this system of one and a half meters or five feet uh, of liquid column. So we say liquid column because um, just to give us the reference, we have to acknowledge that the different fluids have a different different densities, and that has to be taken into account in the in the MPSH consideration. Okay, so comparing the pump speeds there. That's pretty typical um, of, of what we'd see and the MPSH comparison of each of each pump. So that, that's, as I say, for, it's for one particular application. It's, it's intended as an illustration just to show you um, a real world, a real world com comparison. OK, so that's that's it for for the, the discussion, I think, on on MPSH uh, and and cavitation. Uh, Benjamin, you want to could you pop us on to the next slide? So this is time, guys, for us to try and answer some of the questions that you've sent through. Thanks. I can see a few have, have come through so far, so um, feel free to continue to ask. We'll close the Q&A session in, in, in a couple of minutes, but uh, if there's something that you want to ask, then then you've still got opportunity to do it. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll try to uh, to answer these questions. OK, uh, right, so going through the list. We've got a question, how does it increase the power consumption? So um, guys, this tends to be, you know, the comment on the power consumption tends to be in response to a lack of pump performance. What operators can find themselves doing is, is trying to ramp up the equipment. So it's it's in response to uh, trying to counter the effects of of cavitation and loss in performance. So ramping up the equipment is, is what leads to the uh, the increase in power consumption, not the cavitation it, itself. Um, yes, thank you, Andy. Um, next question, uh, can, can you put some light on the NPAP? Yeah. NPAP and NPSH is um, almost, uh, is almost similar, I would say. Um, NPIP uh, results in the calculation of, uh, of pressures, and once you convert it in head, it will become the NPSH uh, net positive suction head. NPIP is a net positive in that pressure. Um, when you come back on the macro, 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 macro views, the typical installation previously in the, in the meeting, we had the tank with absolute pressure, we, we had removed the friction losses. We have, add, uh, we have added the, the static head. Uh, everything, all, all that stuff are in are pressures, basically. And when we remove, uh, we remove the vapor pressure, it's still pressure. Even the head, we can, we can, we can use the head as a pressure, but in the, in the objective of the NPSH air, uh, the NPSH uh, purpose, uh, we we put everything in meter or in feet, so the absolute pressure is used in meter. We compare it, uh, we convert it in meter. Same for the static head, which is directly uh, a length, uh, no, no issue there. Um, friction losses, we can convert the bar, the pascal, uh, in meter as well. Um, everything will be used in meter because it's easier to use it and to to deal with it 
um, the process point of view in the installation to, 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 to deal with the pump uh, 8, uh, suction 8, um, to the tank elevation, it's easier to manage. Um, after that, the MKP is, is the same. It's the same, the same, the same, uh, same property, but given in another unit. That's all. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, okay, next question. Uh, it's a long one and a challenging one. We face a scenario of one megawatt me centrifugal pump where NPSHR test didn't show the popular knee curve. So differential head dropped to approximately 3% and then recovered again after reducing the suction pressure further. It dropped again and continued dropping as expected. Can you clarify this? And in your opinion, which is the actual MPSHR, the first or the second? Uh, OK, so uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, it's, I Personally, it's not something that I've, I've encountered. Um, Nicholas, I'll give you a chance to chip in in a moment, but uh, if you if you've if you've seen this, it's it's quite unique, something that I haven't haven't seen before. So quite unusual. And I guess you guys have looked into the test. I don't know exactly the conditions of the test, and I wonder whether it could be um, a problem with the, the 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 test setup that was used in in this case. Um, it's it's quite strange. I haven't seen a, an instance whereby you have a recovery. And then a, a, a fall again in in this. Um, we'll be uh, happy to have a chat with you offline, uh, Adele, after afterwards, um, and sort of have a little bit more detailed discussion with some some two way conversation. Um, we'd um, also put you in touch with some of our our experts in uh, in fluid dynamics, and we'll see if we can if we can help you on that. But uh, it's certainly got me stumped that one. Uh, take the uh, next question regarding uh, okay. the propane. Can PCM pumps be used to unload propane from the tanker, which is usually a challenge with centrifugal pumps? Um, if the issue is regarding the MPSH, uh, yes, this is a solution that we can uh, that we may envisage. But um, to my mind, uh, propane liquid will be something with quite a low temperature. This is so in order to reply to answer fully this question, we should have all the parameters um, to consider all the limits of each pump technology. Um, we have some temperature limits uh, with some PCPs uh, that we need to, to consider with such application. Uh, the propane may be at the low temperature. But yes, if the NPSH is a real challenge, uh, this is something that, we, that can be uh, cleared by, by PCPs. Okay. Is, uh Acceleration head loss, is it applicable in PC pumps? Um, I would say no. Um, it tends, to, it's it's applicable in a reciprocating pump, which is uh, constantly, so the example we gave earlier is a, a, a piston moving back and forth. Um, this rotation and this, this, this uh, dynamic creates in your piping um, acceleration of fluid um, and peak pressure. So, in a, in a reciprocating pump, the fluid is constantly accelerating and decelerating, and that's where you get a, a loss of energy and, and essentially what is a, a head loss as a, as a result of acceleration in, in, a, in a reciprocating pump system. A progressing cavity pump provides you with a constant smooth flow. There's no pulsation in, in the flow, so there are no um, acceleration head losses in, in a PC pump or system. Thanks for that. Does cavitation really have an impact on progressive cavity pumps? Um, yes, uh, as we, two things. Uh, as we have seen on, on the curve, um, the cavitation will directly uh, create a, a flow rate a drop, a drop of flow rate. Uh, so first of all, it will have an impact on the, on the performances. Um, then it will also have an impact on the on the intake uh, intake parts, as you have seen on some pictures, uh, if some cavitation appears, it will it may create some local uh, local damages on the stator, which is the elastomer part, and also on the rotor, which is metal part, um, but we may alter those parts, so we will alter at the end the performances uh, in the long term. Um, 
that, that the, the missing thing is that you can see. First of all, the performances will be up there. Then the some components and local regions of the component uh, may be altered. Okay, thanks, Nicholas. And is it acceleration head to be known determined by the pump maker? Okay, so we we know that acceleration head isn't something that's relevant to progressing cavity pumps, but more to reciprocating pumps. Now, you might find that the acceleration head being a function of uh, that there is actually a crossover because it's a function of the system and a function of the pump. Um, I know from past experience that the the pump maker in that case, the reciprocating pump maker, um, should be able to calculate or give an indication of the head loss of, of the uh, resulting from, from acceleration. Uh, they know the characteristics of the pump, they know the pulsation, you've given them the fluid data, so I would expect the pump maker to be able to give you an indication of that. And then if it's particularly high, there may be some, some measures that they can take to help to reduce those losses. Thanks, Andy. Um, next one is uh, regarding, um, okay, what if we what if we put for PCP um, on series, uh, on series to increase the discharge pressure or it will affect the mechanical seal and the rotor, or no any effect and no increasing of pressure. Um, I think you, yeah, you want to talk about the NPSH uh, recorder of the pump. Uh, will we see any effect, uh, any effect on putting some pump in series? Not exactly. Um, if, if you put some pump in series, uh, maybe it's, it will be more to achieve a certain uh, level of pressure of air of the complete, uh, complete unit. Um, because maybe stuff is better with one pump or something like that. Um, just uh, bear in mind that the NPSH required will be given by the small, maybe the, the first, uh, I would say, centimeters or millimeters of the pump uh, at, the, at the suction region, where you have the first acceleration to make, uh, to make the fluid you know, to put the fluid in motion. Um, the, the global head of the pump, the global differential pressure applied to the pump, will not affect it uh, really. Uh, look at this effect on, on the mechanical seal, uh, different things. Um, with the PCP, we have kind of the mechanical seal at the discharge side or at the suction region. Uh, if the mechanical seal is located at the discharge region, um, the differential pressure will just affect the chamber of pressure. It will not be directly linked to the, the cavitation. Um, if you have, uh, we may have a specific design of the mechanical seal, specific selection, depending on the vapor pressure of the fluid, but it's not directly linked on the NPSH air of the pump. Okay, guys, um, this is the last question. Um, we have to close the session now. Um, also, oh, so it's a point actually, it's a statement from, from Adele. Uh, power may increase due to increased roughness resulted from the erosion. So that's that's yeah, I guess that's uh, that's pretty feasible, Adele. So if you've got uh, particularly on the centrifugal pump, uh, damaged impellers uh, are going to reduce in result in, in less performance. And again, I guess uh, uh, that's going to increase the the power consumption. So thank you for that. That's uh, that's a great point. Uh, so guys, thank you. That's, uh, that's, we'll close the Q&A session there. By all means, it's not the, the end of the discussion. We're happy to, to engage with you directly. We're going to put some contact details up at the end or through your local PCM representatives. So um, we'd, love to, we'd love to talk to you some more. Unfortunately, we've got to obviously for practical reasons, we've got to limit our, our time today. Um, so uh, Benjamin, Manu, would you pop us on to the to the next slide? We've got a little bit of trivia, maybe. OK, uh, right. So I just wanted to leave you this. It's a, it's a bit of fun, really. Um, what is the MPSH of a dolphin? Uh, what's the relevance you you might ask okay so i just wanted to show you so as i say it's a bit of fun i've got a friend of mine is a zoologist and she's pretty um i was she i discovered this after 
a conversation with her. It was quite interesting. I don't know how we got onto this discussion. I don't think we were talking about MPSH at, at dinner, but uh, well, you know, the the speed that a dolphin can swim at is is actually restricted. The limit on on, on the dolphin stop speed, top speed is is related to cavitation. So the the area around a dolphin's tail, uh, once it's at top speed, the, the the fins are moving at such a speed that you have the same type of effect that you would have in in a pump. You've got low pressure regions and and high pressure regions uh, that lead to the formation of bubbles and the collapse of bubbles, and then of course the little micro jets that that, that are damaging. Uh, whilst they can cause damage to a dolphin, they tend to be a bit more painful than that, uh, and the dolphin stops swimming at uh, at, at top speed because it feels the pain in its tail. So um, that's the that's the reason that's that's the reason dolphins have a top speed of I think it's I don't know from what my friend told me maybe 45 kilometers an hour or something like that. So um, again, a little bit of trivia: MPSH or cavitation at least in in the real world. Um, I don't expect you to come across that one in your day to day activity, but uh, maybe something to remember. Uh, guys, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, we, we appreciate it. Um, just pop some. We just pop some contact details up, up at the end there. Appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules today. Uh, we know you're busy. Um, it's, it's great to have you with us. Feel free to contact us using this information uh, either directly or through your local PTM representative. Um, Thank you. I know it's um, it's later in the day for some of you. For some of us, our days are just beginning. Uh, we've got a, a lot of guys uh, from from Asia. Thank you, especially to the to the contingency from Oman. We've got a big uh, um, a high number of attendees from from Oman today in, in the Middle East and 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 various other countries across the region. So, thanks again for joining us. Um, we hope you took something from that. We hope it was useful. Um, give us a call if you need to. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, thanks to you, Nicola. Thanks to Benjamin for, for, for managing the slides today. Thanks to you. Cheers, guys. Bye bye.